this quote is from focus groups that I did with um, African Americans at Grady Memorial Hospital in the mid 1990s. Given how brothers are treated, why would I put my trust in this system? It's a paraphrase of his sentiment when we were talking about participation in clinical research. If you all remember, I'm sure all of you all remember because you have gray hair like I cover. And um, it, that was an NIH Revitalization Act came out in 1995 and we were struggling. Um, there was tremendous dialogue in the scientific literature about how to include minorities in clinical research. And I felt this quote is still applicable now. Given the way brothers are treated, why would I participate in this healthcare system? <clears throat> the pandemic lifted a veil. One of our, my, uh, my younger colleagues yesterday talked about the physical lifting of a veil across this country um, around, um, for many, it was revealed the centuries of inequity, structural racism, um, and current day oppression. This recognition of a lack of trust um, was universal um, and sort of deeply felt in the genesis for the times that we have been able to be together. And how that community response shaped um, the community response in the pandemic. For racial and ethnic minorities, however, this is the lived experience. This is the ways in which this, they enter, we enter into the healthcare system. And this is the reality of the lived experiences. And this current mistrust obviously is fueled by misinformation, but that misinformation is grounded in this knowledge of historical context, past unethical behavior, and current day inequalities. So how have we earned mistrust as a, as a profession? Um, and I will go through, I was, um, it was suggested to me that much of what I'm gonna say you already know, which is fine, is typically for some of these kinds of talks, but I felt it was bearing, it bared repeating because it was absent in yesterday's conversation. And so I want to make sure that we, when we're talking about mistrust and why, that we realize that we have actually earned this in a variety of ways. The golden era was not so golden for many um, black and brown people um, in the um, 30s and 40s. Marginalized communities, um, including racial and ethnic minorities, LGBTQ individuals, low-income populations, and immigrants, so like, that's like half of the population, right? Have faced systemic barriers to quality health care over and over and over again. And throughout history, marginalized communities have experienced discrimination, bias, unequal treatment within the healthcare system, and this has led to health um, disparities and health outcomes. And then as we think about, again, this historical context of medical experimentation, there have been certain marginalized communities that have been subject to unethical medical experimentation, Tuskegee, or as Tuskegee University would prefer you to call it, the US public health system study of syphilis at Tuskegee, um, where African-American men were denied treatment for syphilis without their knowledge or consent. Oh, We've earned mistrust through Acts, um, where marginalized communities have faced challenges, as we saw our, um, our patient, challenges in accessing healthcare services due to factors such as lack of insurance coverage or even when you have insurance coverage, um, transportation barriers, limited healthcare facilities in underserved areas, and we saw this revealed in the pandemic. Historically, the healthcare system has not always, when we talk about equality versus equity, I love Kamara Jones's um, uh, framing of providing what people need according to their needs. We haven't been responsive to the unique needs and perspectives of marginalized communities, leading to not only mistrust, but suboptimal care. So let's take a little tour through our storied history. Um, and again, how and way, the ways in which um, individuals from historically marginalized racial and ethnic communities have contextualized this misinformation the enslavement and Jim Crow um, era, this long history of enslavement of kidnapped Africans um, and racial segregation in the United States has led to a deep-rooted mistrust of, um, among African Americans. Institutionalized racism, and we'll talk, I, I know Reggie has a question for me, and what is structural racism? I'm happy to answer that. <laughs> um, but institutionalized racism and violence experienced during this era have left, had a long-lasting impact impact on trust in societal institutions. And 
my co historic, um, historian colleagues yesterday talked about the wedding and marrying of the medical um, system and other um, um, institutions. Forced sterilization. In the early 20th century, forced sterilization programs um, implemented uh, and targeted racial and ethnic minorities, particularly African Americans, Native Americans, um, and Puerto Ricans. And these programs were rooted in the eugenics movement that we as a profession um, championed in theories that violated the rights of um, individuals. The Indian boarding schools, um, indigenous communities in the United States and Canada were subjected to the forced removal of children from their families and placed in boarding schools with the aim of assimilation. The physical and cultural abuse suffered in those institutions created significant mistrust towards educational and government systems. Police brutality and the carceral system, and this is what galvanized us, this is where we were all sort of um, transfixed and rooted to our televisions, the public murders of black and brown um, children, men and women. This disproportionate targeting, harassment, and mistreatment of BIPOC individuals by law enforcement and the criminal justice system have contributed to earn mistrust. There is a systematic targeting of black and brown communities and these high profile cases such as, and I will say their names, Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd have fueled a national conversation about systemic racism and mistrust. Similarly, this, the media representations of communities of color have historically stereotyped and vilified um, in media portrayals. And these negative stereotypes, again, more evidence of where and how um, we should be tr trusting systems, have perpetuated and contributed to the misinformation and the willingness to look at alternative um, portrayals and information. Immigration policies such as the Chinese Exclusion Act um, and Japanese internments during World War II. Ongoing anti-immigrant um, sentiment have created mistrust among immigrant communities. And these policies have targeted ethnic groups, racial and ethnic groups, and force, fostered a sense of marginalization and discrimination. I wanted to make sure that it was clear that this is not just about black folk mistrusting, right? This is systemic, consistent, and ongoing. Misinformation, skepticism, mistrust, we've sort of conflated these terms and used them in kind of a slippery way, and I'm not gonna do a whole lot to disaggregate that, but I just wanted to acknowledge that we have been talking about a range of concepts um, over the last day and probably into today. And this historical context of inequalities fuel mistrust and skepticism around underserved communities, and there's a, a sense-making, a meaning-making, when there's a healthcare system that has time and again demonstrated a lack of trust, trustworthiness by producing health outcomes that are poorer in some populations versus other. So making sense, to using this historical context to make sense of the current day experience is, the, is, um, is what my, I hope um, you'll be able to see. The spread of false information, myths, stereotypes, conspiracy theories, what I talked to my siblings about, influence healthcare decision making. And this doubt has led to, I, and I have seen it in my families and in my patients, delays in foregoing seeking, foregoing or delays in actually even seeking care or inconsistently following recommendations and treatment plans. Vaccine hesitation. Um, I prefer the term vaccine deliberation because it's not, I, in my experience, in my family, in my patients, this is an ongoing accrual of information, researching in ways that may not look like research to us, talking with colleagues, talking with friends, talking with doctors, and just making a decision based on their own agency. So it's a deliberative process. It's not simply hesitancy. It's an active process, and we have the opportunity to insert ourselves if we choose to. And we have seen the disproportionate impact of misinformation, mistrust, and skepticism um, in public health crises. And I th my hope is moving in, because um, black and brown, historically marginalized communities are, will always be disproportionately impacted um, in any public health crisis. As a colleague of mine says, you know, when white America sneezes, black folk and brown folks get pneumonia. 
So we have to be, we have an opportunity. We've been meeting. And so we need to be thinking about what can we do as a profession to mitigate these disproportionate impacts. The first I would say is demonstrating trustworthiness. And several of folks have shifted this, the idea of mistrust to the fact that why would anyone, this is again, my colleagues yesterday, common sense, why would any black and brown person, given their experiences, given the historical context, place their trust in a healthcare system that has produced the outcomes that it has? In terms of demonstrating trustworthiness, and I know that we'll have a long conversation over the course of today, my hope is that we will shift the paradigm. It's not why is people not trusting our healthcare system? Why are they believing other sources of information? But what can we do to demonstrate that we are a trustworthy source of information for our patients and for communities? First is acknowledging historical and systemic issues. We cannot try to brush this um, away or hide it under the carpet. We have to be out, up front and out front with this. David, yesterday, um, both of us were at Grady at the same time, talked about the two Grady's, which I had never heard of until I got there. But are clear, be clear about this history of segregation. Acknowledge this historical injustices, unethical practices, and systemic biases that have contributed to mistrust among historically marginalized communities. Recognize and account for these past wrongdoings. Someone mentioned truth and reconciliation. I would love for us to think about how we might be able to, to galvanize something like that. Recognize and account for these past wrongdoings such as exploitation of marginalized populations in research studies. We have to get our arms around and, and have the will, because we certainly have the skill to address healthcare disparities. We have to make um, healthcare equity a key component of institutional strategic plans as the IHI has noted. This has to be foundational in our work. This can't be a passing, fa a passing phase um, where we're at the whim of the political forces that are out there trying to deconstruct and, um, and, um, and dismantle diversity and equity and inclusion efforts. We have to, as a profession, profession stay strong in this moral grounding. Take proactive measures to address health disparities that disproportionately impact communities of color and allocate resources. Again, not window dressing, but make sure that they're clear places in the budget, right? Your budget tells you what your mission is and tells you what your priorities are. Allocate resources to improve access to quality care, reduce barriers, ensure equitable distribution of healthcare services, including preventive care and screenings because I'm a primary care doc. We need to monitor and address bias. We cannot just assume that good folks are gonna do the right thing, particularly in a system that is built to give the outcomes that it gives. We need to train folks to address conscious and unconscious bias, um, to understand and address cultural nuances, historical context, to help healthcare professions better understand and respond to the unique needs of historically marginalized patients. We need to assess and address bias within our organization's policies, procedures, and practices, implement the strategies that we know work to mitigate implicit bias and discriminatory practices and establish the protocols to ensure fair and equitable treatment for all patients. Transparency is probably our biggest tool um, to be able to build trust through transparency by openly sharing information about our policies, particularly when they're in line to address equity. Um, communicate openly about potential risk, benefit, and alternatives to treatments, Ad address any conflicts of interest, and be transparent about the any financial relationships we have with pharmaceutical companies or other stakeholders that might, if uncovered, um, lead to um, mistrust. We have the opportunity, um, and a, a great opportunity if you look around this room, um, to promote diversity and inclusion within our leaders and leadership, and decision make because it and decision-making positions. Diversity in these influential roles can help improve an understanding, um, foster trust, and ensure that an organization's policies and practices are, are sensitive um, to the needs of communities. We have, and I've been, been intentional about putting the system level kinds of changes before the individual practice, because yesterday we focused a lot on what the individual doctor did wrong. I know if I were in that situation, I could easily have made those mistakes. 
Um, and I'll just be open about that because it's humbling to think about colleagues in those positions that have led to this, to the kinds of um, reactions that those patients experience. We need to encourage active listening, equity, and patients to address concerns and build trust, use interpreters or multilingual staff members to overcome language barriers, and we need to engage with communities. Um, we need to, we, we are them, right? Um, we need to partner with local organizations, leaders, and advocates to establish their presence, build relationships based on trust and mutual respect. Ensuring language accessibility, providing clear linguistically and culturally appropriate information as we mitigate misinformation, use plain language materials, visual aids, and multimedia resources um, to enhance health literacy and provide translational services for individuals. So again, the communication is, um, the structure of communication is not what's impeding um, de demonstrating trustworthiness. And I'm gonna just move to this summary so that we can, we can start having a conversation. So in summary, I think we need to address these challenges. <clears throat> it, to, um, it's gonna require some effort to build trust, improve health literacy and combat misinformation. This is why we've been meeting and my hope is that these flip charts and our gallery walk later will bring surface even more. It's gonna be crucial to engage with communities to understand their concerns and provide appropriate, accessible and accurate health information collaboration between healthcare providers, public health agencies, community organization, and trusted leaders is gonna be essential to address the impact of misinformation, skepticism, and mistrust. So it can't be business as usual. It can't be just us looking at ourselves. We need to engage others um, because those others are sources of trusted information. And the demonstration of trustworthiness through this continued effort to address healthcare disparities I think is the linchpin of what we can do. I'm not sure if you had a chance to read, if the audience had a chance to read that first paper that's listed uh, in the app, but you wrote a JAMA Insights paper titled, Vaccine Hesitancy is a Scapegoat for Structural Racism. So can you define, uh -oh. <laughs> so can you define for our audience what structural racism is and how you saw vaccine hesitancy being used as a scapegoat for it? And then are there strategies that you recommend that we can use to interrupt this scapegoating and encourage the explicit naming or intervening on this type of racism. Okay. Um, so at that point in the pandemic, there was a lot of conversation around vaccine hesitancy. There was, um, and again, it was putting the onus back on our patients and our community members it, it, that they didn't trust, they didn't believe in vaccines, they had all these quote unquote conspiracy theories um, and really, to me, the issue was a structural issue, uh, at least in North Carolina. And I imagine North Carolina was like the rest of the country where you signed up for a vaccine online, um, and you signed up for a spot, um, you, uh, um, the vaccines were sort of allocated by different regions and nece not necessarily according to need. And it just felt to me that there was not a, there wasn't a, a broader view. Again, it devolved to the individual and what we typically see, have seen, is that it's the onus is placed back on the patient, that the, it's the patient's problem, it's not our problem. And we weren't willing to sort of look at how our systems had um, impeded, constrained the opportunities for individuals to make the choices that they needed to make. And this is absent misinformation. This was, um, you know, we're talking about folks who work an hourly wage who are essential, quote unquote, essential workers, but not essential enough to let them go and get the vaccine, um, who um, didn't have a computer. And if they had a computer, didn't have broadband access. Uh, we're, we're talking about folks that, um, we all, I remember being, I can't remember where, I, it was like Target or someplace, and this older gentleman came in trying to get a vaccine. And they were like, well, you didn't sign up online, this older African-American man. I'm just like, are you serious right now? It was just, uh, it was horrific. At that point, it just seemed to me that we had just abdicated our responsibility to our most vulnerable um, populations. So maybe the, I gotta go back and read that. Maybe the language is a little strong, but that was how I felt at the time. Maybe, maybe scapegoating wasn't the right term. <laughs> um, my next question is about, um, you mentioned the US Public Health Service syphilis study uh, at Tuskegee. And I think oftentimes discussions around the mistrust 
that communities of color have with the healthcare delivery system and with providers focus on that historical mistreatment. But for many of us who have to navigate the healthcare delivery system as people of color, we, we experience present day discrimination. So what is the impact in this relationship between racial and ethnic minority communities and the healthcare delivery system and providers if we don't focus on both that historical mistreatment and the present day discrimination that communities of color and individuals of color experience? Well, uh, let me just say a little bit about the Tuskegee, um, the U.S. Public Health Service study of syphilis at Tuskegee. So I made it through almost my entire residency uh, learning about syphilis and never hearing about the Tuskegee study. And when I did, I was horrified. And the way I found out was um, they, I can't, I, I, we were talking about like tertiary syphilis and there were only images of black men. Um, and I, I asked, I, I, I thought it was curious and somehow, I can't remember how I put the pieces together, found out about the study and that where these images were from. Were from. And so I'm assuming now that in medical education that our students are hearing about this, but the reality is we're at a point where people, quote unquote, are tired of hearing about it. It's been, it was 400 years ago, you know, it was X, you know, decades ago, and the reality is people are still living this. I went to see Porgy and Bess, um, the opera, and in the, just a couple months ago in North Carolina, and in that, um, in that opera, they talk about grave robbing. And so it is in the current day consciousness, regardless of whether we wanna talk about it or not. So number one, we need to realize that it's out there and it's out there in many forms. I was relating to my table yesterday when the study came up and there were many versions of what happened and I felt um, in my sophomoric way that I wanted to make sure everybody got the right facts about the study and so I had my um, focus group moderator, we wrote up a little script after folks gave their opinions, we gave this accurate, accurate information about the study and you know the participants, you know, to their credit were like, yeah, that's the way you understand it but okay, so what? This is my understanding of it. And they were at least, um, they were gracious in their dismissal of their, of their, um, of, their um, um, of that quote unquote accurate depiction of, of the history of that study. So it's, it's in the current day consciousness. And for us to not acknowledge that and all of the other ways that this, um, that our medical community has um, participated, I, I think is, we won't be able to get to where we're hoping to be in terms of regaining trust. Um, so a, a bit off script, but, I, but in this example, I think what's really interesting here is, you know, the assumption that because you are also African-American that you present the facts and then everyone in the room is just going to accept it. Right, not the case. <laughs> uh, or one challenge in the work related to health disparities and health equity is that some might define the goal for this work as improvement that is the reduction in the disparity. And others might define the goal as the elimination of the disparity com completely. How important do you think it is to make the goal explicit in building community and developing trust, that is whether or not you're trying to work towards a reduction in that difference or the complete elimination of that difference? But why would we have disparities in our goals around disparities? I mean, like, why wouldn't we want to eliminate inequality? Uh, to me, it's, um, it, I, I can't remember which CDC, which decade um, of the CDC goals uh, they were, but it was a reduction in disparities. So African Americans had this goal for flu vaccines, white Americans had a higher goal, and it just didn't, I mean, so why wouldn't we all have the same goal? What, what, what is the point? <laughs> yes. so, um, so this question comes from, I, I used to teach a course called Measuring and Reporting Health Disparities mm -hmm. when I was at the Harvard School of Public Health. And I, I found this quote from, from Dr. King um, in, a, in the book From Community to Chaos, where he said, there's a challenge in how white people and black people define equality. <laughs> because white people de might define it as improvement. But black people generally take, take the... Um, take the definition or take white people at their word in, in terms of how they think about equality. And we think about it as we want equal, equal, equal. Yes. <laughs> That's it's in the word. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but, 
but al- but also but also I'm I'm reminded of of some work that I did um, working on uh, state health disparities reports um, and how you know those of us around many of us around the table had different notions about what our goals yeah. were. And so that clarity and being explicit about what the goal. Yeah, thank you yes. for that. Yeah. Yeah. So. I really like the title of your uh, um, of your talk where you pulled in uh, a quote. So I work now um, at Zero Prostate Cancer, which is a prostate cancer education support and advocacy organization as the vice president of health equity. And that that quote resonated so well just because it's what I hear from from African-American men trying to navigate the prostate cancer care delivery system. Um, And I think that quote really highlights the notion that men, especially men who experience discrimination across multiple systems in our society oftentimes view the healthcare delivery system as a place of last resort. Absolutely. So what are some strategies that you found successful in getting men of color to engage sooner? I think it, it, for me, in my clinic, I think it's word of mouth. And I actually have one patient that has told me that he keeps telling all his doc, all his friends about me. I think once folks find somebody that they feel comfortable with, regardless of, um, of you know, what my, my social identity might be. It, it makes a difference. And I heard in our conversation yesterday that even for at least one of the patients that we um, heard yesterday was, was able to maintain the clinical relationship. And it's, I, think some, I think part of it is being able to say, I don't know, and, you know, my, um, um, I care for this amazing transgender woman. And I remember, I mean, I didn't learn about transgender care in medical school. And I remember talking with her and said, can we work on this together? Because I'm learning. And she was like, I'm, you were like the first person to willing to admit it. So I think it's about being honest and authentic. So on, honest in a way that is still asking for partnership not just, I don't know, I don't know what's going on with you, but like, let's partner on this together. Your expertise is important as in terms of your lived experience. And we can partner on this together. I bring something, you bring something, let's, let's work on this together. That we often hear, you know, that black men don't like to talk about their health. And I think we, we hear, Oh no, they talk about their health. We, they just don't talk about their, their doctors. Yes. <laughs> but, but we, 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 we hear that so much that I think oftentimes people may take, take that into either the research or, or the clinical encounter. And as I said, I, I work for a prostate cancer organization where we have support groups and we have to cut those meetings yes. off because men are talking about sort of their- I've had yeah. focus groups around cardiovascular disease in the community. And li- literally we recruited 12 to 15 people, like 25 men showed up. And they were like, Doc, can we do, like, I was like, bring them all in, separate the groups, let them talk. And they would not stop talking. <laughs> so I have I've one last question before, before we turn it over to the audience. Um, so in public health, um, we often talk about the fundamental causes to explain health disparities. And these fundamental causes refer to resources such as money, knowledge, prestige, power, and beneficial social connections being sorted by socioeconomic position and that these resources create the social context where health behaviors are implemented and our health status is produced. Mm -hmm. What role do the fundamental causes play in the misinformation conversation with communities of color and the healthcare delivery system? Well, this, I think, goes back to the issue around systemic oppression and structural inequality um, and the ways in which health is produced outside of our healthcare system as well as inside and how that context um, shapes, frames, and um, gives in individuals and communities a sense of what to expect in our healthcare system as well. I, um, I, I, my hope, my hope for today is, um, and you know, wherever this dialogue takes us, this conversation takes us, is that we'll be willing to look not only at what happens within the healthcare system today, what's happened before and what's happening in and around us so that we can really make some meaningful change. We have the social capital. We have the influence as a healthcare profession to be able to pull our, that lever in terms of social influence. I think we are poised to be able to do this. We just have to have the will to do so. 